Today is May 3rd, 2019, and this is episode 122 of Plane Savers! I hope you didn't film that noise. <laughs> Making a line for Ronnie right now. We got the PRC in the tank. So tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, we'll put the sump back on, and day after we'll put some fuel in and try it. But pretty, uh, pretty sure it'll stop the leak. It was only two small bolts. Got the PRC in there. Back in the hangar now. We're just blowing some lines out. Um, more checks. Going to put oil in the left. After that line, oil in the right. So tomorrow, any luck, we'll be doing a feathering check. Who's coming in tonight? Dustin's going to be here in about two hours, the big guy. So now we should move freight because he's a great freight mover. <laughs> but this morning started with uh, the uh, bagels, fresh, rolled into the donuts and finished off with the uh, pizza at lunch and none of us can move. <laughs> it was just, just, just dough logged. <laughs> Bobby and the rest of the team has informed me that we want to check the vent lines which are the easy access into the tank um, to, you know, have a wasp nest. So we're trying to take the rubber lines between the hard vent line that goes to the bottom of the wing, uh, between the bottom of the wing and the, and the top, so we can push some air through there and see if there's any junk left in that line. And uh, that'll get our vent lines nice and clear, and so we can prevent insects from going in there in the future now. So yeah, now we're proceeding to uh, struggle with a 70-year-old rubber lines that haven't been taken apart too many times in their life, so another fun day here at Plane Savers. We found some little problems, but it was cool to, uh, to fix. For example, the ice shield right there, uh, there was about five liters of, uh, of water draining from there when we unscrewed some, some of the screws. Um, we fixed the uh, oil tank, uh, we've had uh, some, uh, some paint going on, so everything is going good. I'm happy. Today the plan is to uh, change the and uh, first remove all those screws to change the light here and the glass part that uh, went here. So I had to broke it because it was already cracked and it's the only way I, I can access uh, the interior. All those screws here are the ones that I couldn't uh, I couldn't remove, so they are all seized and I'll have to uh, try to remove them. So that's the plan for today. Oil and more oil and more oil. They take a lot of oil. More in my car. Parquet. Anybody remember that commercial? Parquet. Butter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Butter. Butter. Parquet. Okay. Hey, we should pull that stunt on the young guys and see what happens. See we, could, money. we could send them for a hey, bucket. Hey, Benjamin, Benjamin. Send Benjamin. them for a bucket hey, of prop wash. Young guy. Let's do it. Let's do it today. Look. You ever see this? Watch, watch. Butter. Parquet. Parquet. You ever seen that commercial? Probably not, eh? Too young. Yeah, it was funny. Back in the day. Oh, but we're in Quebec. It should be. <laughs> you're, you're laughing. Pourquoi? 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 Okay. Butter. Burr. Burr. That's just a French joke. Good. Good to the last drop. These are uh, oil pails we converted to pour pails just so you can fill them. So we're running uh, 120 weight aeroshell mineral oil. No, W oil, sorry. W120. Non. This is the last fluid we need before we can run. We've got hydraulic oil, we got uh, we don't need flaps to run, but tomorrow we'll swing the gear. Then we can uh, check feathering pumps, props feathered, and fuel pressure checks, and we're ready to run. So folks, uh, where have I been all episode? Uh, well, it's been one of those days. Um, but I'll come back at the end of the episode to give you guys a proper goodbye. Uh, right now, I'm a little bit excited uh, to be able to send off this amazing video from Rob in Washington, D.C. Check this out. Danny Price, the new uh, Plane Savers champion for most submitted videos. Check out Danny's video. Uh, check out Rob's video, and I'll, I'll, I'll see you at the goodbye. Only a couple of more weeks until Normandy. It's late at night. We're inside the hangar. There's a jet outside enhancing the audio. We're doing a carb change. It must be time for the Washington, D.C. edition of Plane Savers. 
Hey Mikey, good afternoon. It's Rob coming to you from the PMDG Flight Operations Headquarters here just outside of Washington, D.C. With me in the hangar here is a 1945 Douglas DC-3C. She was delivered to the Army Air Corps in the first week of November of 1945, which just happens to be the same week my father was born. Uh, so she and my dad are both proof that with modern maintenance and uh, enough spare parts, you too can lead a long and fruitful life. But this was one of the last DC-3s built from new parts. Uh, after the war effort was over, they started to assemble new airframes, mostly from a collection of parts left over. But this one was uh, one of the last ones built from new parts. She was surplused out right away and wound up in the hands of CBS Corporation, uh, who used her as their corporate transport for a number of years. She then wound up going to outboard and marine manufacturing up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, uh, again as a corporate transport, eventually wound up uh, working as a tour uh, operation over the Grand Canyon. She was based out of Burbank where there was a company that specialized in uh, bringing Japanese tourists in to fly them over the Grand Canyon in a DC-3 and this was the airplane they used. She then wound up back in Oshkosh in the hands of uh, the Experimental Aircraft Association where she did tours and uh, then was completely rehabilitated by Basler Turbo Conversions. They obviously did not put turbines on her. They did the reconditioning at the request of the uh, ERA Alaska Airlines, who put this airplane on a Part 121 commercial air carrier scheduled certificate and flew her in scheduled passenger service in the state of Alaska up until uh, about 2003. In 2003, she was withdrawn from service because the FAA here in, uh, in Virginia, uh, or in Washington just down the street, decided that it was important that every airplane have a bulletproof cockpit door uh, and the engineering cost to put that into a DC-3 just didn't really make it worthwhile. So she went up for sale in 2003. We bought her in 2011 and wound up doing a complete nose to tail rehab and put her into the condition that she's in today. We've got our airplane completely uncowled. We are in the process of doing the last series of checks in preparation for a transatlantic crossing. We're going to be flying the airplane up through uh, Gander, across to Narsisuik, Greenland, then of course uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, and then on into Wick, Scotland before bringing her into the Imperial War Museum in Duxford. We're going to be leaving on the 14th of May. We expect it to take five to seven days for us to get over, depending on uh, weather, of course. Our airplane is fully de-iced. She's also fully IFR capable. We do not intend to fly her in those types of conditions, however, because even though the airplane is perfectly capable of it, we are uh, a bunch of professionals who come from other areas of flying. We don't fly DC-3s in that type of conditions uh, like you folks at Buffalo do. So we choose to stick to what we're good at, make sure we fly her in decent weather. And uh, as you can see, we also want to make sure we don't mar the paint by flying her through any icing conditions or things of that nature. If you look closely at the uh, image, you can probably see she's covered in tree pollen. It is pollen season here in Virginia, so she sort of has a green tinge to her. We're going to have her out flying this weekend and hopefully give her a bath as well, so that'll clean all of that off. The uh, flag you see there, those that are astute will notice that it is a 48-star flag. That was intentional. The airplane is in the post-war colors of Pan American World Airways. These are the colors flown uh, by Pan Am in 1945. It's a, a brilliant white and a bold navy blue. It's designed to evoke uh, uh, confidence and optimism for the future that was uh, true of the post-war years. We've got those, uh, those colors were pulled out of the, the Pan American archives down in Miami, so we do have them matched correctly. So this is what she would have looked like. Our airplane's pretty clean, as you can see, even up inside the gear wells. Things have uh, remained quite clean. We uh, we probably spend about an hour cleaning her for every hour we spend flying her. That uh, doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but when you love being around a DC-3, uh, any excuse to be able to spend some time with her is good. Mikey, our airplane is a, a show and a transportation airplane, so we've got a couple of unusual adaptations uh, that we have installed in the airplane. Back here, uh, in the tail cone area, we've got a whole chest filled with spare parts. So we carry spare starters, generators, things of that nature, anything that might cause us to get stuck someplace that we can't get back from. Um, in addition, under here, 
we have a, uh, a temporary tow head that we use here. This will attach to pretty much any Tron bar uh, at an FBO so that the airplane can be towed if needs to be. And then of course we store a whole bunch of, uh, of oil down here. We, we keep about 25 gallons of oil on board uh, at all times. That way, no matter where we're going, we've got plenty on board. And for our transatlantic crossing, we will carry uh, about another 30 gallons on top of that just to make sure we've got plenty of oil. And of course, since we're all fans of plane savers, right there in the tail of the airplane, plane savers. A couple of other things that are unusual about our airplane. We've got, um, you make that look so easy, Mikey. We've got uh, LED nav strobes installed on this airplane. We did that for increased visibility uh, and for increased reliability. Here in the Washington DC capital region, we spend an awful lot of time down at fairly low altitude. And uh, when we're doing that, uh, there's an awful lot of traffic that, uh, that needs to be able to see us. So we like to be able to light the airplane up and make it as brilliant as we possibly can be in order to help other pilots see us. In addition, we also installed these right here. Oh, see, I almost got it right that time. We installed these. These are um, LED landing lights. They are incredibly brilliant. And on top of uh, providing an awful lot of illumination, the other thing that they do for us is that they make it uh, so that we don't lose illumination as we're landing. As you know, flying a, a DC-3 with generators, when you start to reduce power, you tend to lose some of the illumination from the bulbs. So we don't have that problem with LEDs. A Couple of other things that are unusual about our airplane, you'll notice looking around the base of the propeller blades, there's uh, these little triangles. And uh, we've had a number of folks at air shows ask us what those are. Those are counterweights. Uh, we had a fellow by the name of Jim Jeffries come out and apply a strobe technology to both engines after we had our propellers overhauled. And after running the engine at certain RPMs with a certain strobe, he would add these little counterweights in order to damp out vibration from the engines and the propellers. And it was amazing for the first flight after we had that done just how smoothly the engines ran. As you know, on a big project, sometimes things can just kind of go haywire. When we restored the airplane back in 2012, we had her painted out in Ogden, Utah, and we provided uh, a stencil to the, uh, the paint shop in order to be able to put the original Pan Am winged logo on the airplane. What we didn't anticipate was that when they would paint the other side of the airplane, they would simply reverse the logo and put it on. So um, about a year after the airplane was painted, we were looking at it in the hangar and realized that the globe inside the, uh, the winged uh, logo was backward. So the poor paint shop, they had to come out and completely redo those in order to make them right. They had a sense of humor about it, so did we, uh, but it was funny that we were just so close to the airplane for so long, we didn't even notice it until, well, Eric, one of our guys, he noticed it, he notices everything. So Mikey, we'll give you the quick grand tour of our uh, support center back here. It's maybe not as comprehensive or as complex as what you got up there at Buffalo. But in here, we have our, our spares department. We've got uh, a 20-foot uh, sea can, which you know we Americans call a shipping container. We've got a 20-foot shipping container full of spare parts, including uh, ailerons, rudders, things like that. Spare engine, but it needs to be overhauled. We've got our our crew lounge right in here. This is of course named after Wilbur Wright. Uh, every now and then someone will come in and suggest that we named it after Wilbur Wright because he was the first pilot to fly and that's actually not true. We're all airline employees so we named it after Wilbur Wright because he lost the coin toss so he was the first non-rev to get bumped. Well Mikey sure have enjoyed giving you the tour. I hope you've enjoyed coming along for it. Uh, I should probably get back to work here before the rest of the crew figures out that I've been goofing off talking to you. For any of your viewers who would like to follow us along as we make the transit across to Europe for the summer, you can follow along at clippertabithamay.com. We've got a, a live flight plan there that will show you in real time as the airplane's moving right off the satellite data link where we are in the world. And we hope you'll, uh, you'll enjoy making the crossing with us. We're sorry you can't come along. And uh, Mikey, we're sorry you're not going to make it to Normandy, but hopefully we'll get an opportunity to see you real soon. Hey, Mikey. Danny at the Atlantic Canada Aviation Museum. Today we're going to look at our CP-121 tracker. This model was built by de Havilland Canada for the Royal Canadian Navy. She served at Shearwater, uh, but it was damaged in a ground handling accident and used as an instructional airframe. So we acquired it from Shearwater. These airplanes were used for any submarine patrol, and yes, they did fly off carriers, 
and we did have carriers, she flew off the Bonaventure. So here's, here's a model of the Bonaventure. Look at, looking around here, big airplane, twin engine, right our 1820s. Now we're going to go get in her, Mikey. She's a little bit of a crawl and she's a tight space. Here we go, we'll go underneath her. There's her tail number, it's 12176. Okay, so the camera might get a little jumpy going here because this is a small airplane inside, so here we go. Try not to bump my head, because they didn't make these for big people. Okay, here we are. This is the back end. I'm going to close these up for now. We don't have everything in her. Close these two panels up. There's the two men set back here. ASW and all that stuff. Okay, so now I'm going to open these back up. And now I'm going to try to get into this cockpit without hurting myself. It's really tiny. We'll walk up in here and have a quick look. Again, we don't have everything in this one. She was used as an instructional, so there's some stuff missing, but we got most of it. So now I'm going to attempt to sit myself down in here. Okay, one foot in. Oh, that was better than I thought. I wouldn't want to try to get out of her in a hurry, that's for sure. There we go. Sitting down in her. It looks like there's nothing here, but actually, there's a cover that sits over everything. That way I can get in and out. Radios and stuff. There we go, we come up here, there's the landing gear handles and stuff. There's the handle for the arrestor hook. Let me see if I can get a better look at that. Where is it? There it is right there. Looks like an arrestor hook. The wing fold, all kinds of stuff all around. You can actually pretty much look right down the side of the airplane when you look out in the bubble here. And it's got a window where you can go up and out. That's the emergency exit. Here, I'm just gonna close it for you. See if I can get her to close. That's what it looks like with the window all shut up. But it gets kind of warm in here, so we leave her on. There's your throttles. And there's your pitch. And there's your mixture. But anyway, Mikey, there you go. That's in the tracker. She's pretty complete. we still got some things we need to do. Now let's look back to the back of the airplane. There's what she looks like going back that way. There's circuit breakers everywhere. Anyway, Mikey, there you go. We'll have a quick look out the nose here. There's our T-33 over there and our Link trainer. We can look across at the L-19, over at the harbor, back at the 5 and the Jetstar. And here's the thing. There's the fire bomber. There's the Avenger. It's a single engine airplane and it sits way bigger than this one does. Anyway, Mikey, hope you like it. Let me know what else you want to see. We'll talk at you later. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Rob and Danny. Um, this goodbye is very hard. This is a, I did a lot of takes on this and I just want to say, um, if you haven't heard, there's been a, an incident with the DC-3 out of my hometown in Hay River. Uh, the crew is fine. Um, and Everything uh, for a terrible situation is as good as it could be. Um, I'm very thankful that nobody was hurt. Uh, and to move forward, um, we're going to be focusing on this airplane, the crew here. I send all my uh, good wishes to my friends and family back home that are uh, working hard around the clock to uh, provide, you know, unstoppable customer service for the people of the north and to deal with what's happened today. And uh, so I just want to thank everybody in the Plane Savers Nation for all the support, and uh, we'll be seeing you tomorrow. Bye.